Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeremy Green with the National Corn Growers Association. Thanks for joining us this morning. Just a little housekeeping things before we get started. <clears throat> um, you're all on mute, um, which is great. Uh, if you could stay on mute while Chris is talking, that'd be good. Um, after Chris is done talking, if you have questions, if you could type your name and who you work for in the chat, and then we can recognize you that way, and then you can ask your question. You can unmute yourself then. Um, if you are on the phone and not on the computer audio, to unmute yourself, you would hit star six, and then to mute yourself back, you would hit star six again. Um, thanks again, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. Good morning. My name is Chris Edgington, and I farm near St. Ansgar, Iowa, with my wife, son, dad, and brother. It takes all of us to run our farm well. Dad always believed in leaning on each other to get the job done, so we did. And I soon learned to appreciate the simple satisfaction of, of working together on a common task. That life lesson probably helped me to prepare me for my new position more than anything else. On Friday, I became president of the National Corn Growers Association. Making family farms like ours better is what drives me. It's also why I ran for the corn board and it's why I ran to be president of NCGA. And just like our farm, my goal as president is to make NCGA the best team it can be. That starts with staying focused on our top priorities. And these include growing demand for our products, protecting profitability of our businesses, and building trust in our sustainable production methods. Expanding the, higher, the use of higher ethanol blends is one way to grow demand. Good news is we got a bill that'll do just that. The bipartisan Next Generation Fuels Act would require automakers to phase in higher levels of clean, low carbon, octane ethanol. Working together, we can get this passed. The threat of higher taxes has us all concerned about profitability right now. Congress is considering a plan to raise taxes on farmers by removing the stepped up basis provision, raising capital gains taxes, lowering inheritance levels, and lowering the 1031 exchange limits. It's gonna take all of us in agriculture working together to persuade them to drop this bad idea. And I believe we can get this done. Building trust in how we farm starts with sharing our story of sustainable corn production with our value chain partners and policymakers in DC. The depth and richness of that story is definitely something we must work together on. The thing about this job, there will always be issues to work on, good ones, bad ones, and others that fall someplace in between. I can't say for sure what they'll be or when we'll be confronted with them. But I can promise that my approach to solving these problems hasn't changed a bit from what my dad taught me long ago. We'll tackle them together as a team because working together works. Speaking of team, I look at all of you as part of the NCGA team. You are the voice of agriculture and you make sure our message is heard. For that, I thank you. Thank you for being our partner. As president, I plan on having many conversations with all of you about agriculture and the corn industry. We have a great team that you are part of. And as we all know, working together works. With that, I'll take your questions. Thanks, Chris. And just a reminder, everybody, if you've got a question, you can type your name and who you're with in the chat. Um, and then we'll unmute you and you can ask that question. If you're on the phone only, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and then star six to unmute yourself. Um, and we'll go from there. 
Any questions? I, have, I don't see any so far. Chris, I've got a question from Jackie Fatka with Farm Progress. Sorry if I said that wrong. What are your thoughts on the trade strategy from the Biden administration? Well, Jackie, you know, trade is important to agriculture. It's important to America. Um, we have a tremendous amount of ability to produce both ag products and other products in this country. And we want the Biden administration to be proactive in their approach to trade. Um, we've got some long-term partners, uh, Mexico and Canada, that we've done a lot with, and, and yet we maybe have some challenges with them. That's why USMCA is such a great piece of material. China is, is obviously the wild card, um, and right now we seem to have pretty decent trading relationships with them. But we wanna build on that Southeast Asia region that is continuing to grow, add people, add demand for food products, and other products. And we certainly need to spend some more time uh, encouraging and educating the European Union that uh, what we produce is a safe, wholesome product that they need to utilize. So our message simply is we need trade and we need more trade. And we will take it in all places from all countries because we are a good trading partner and a reliable supplier. Thanks, Chris. I've got Todd Neely from DTN. He says, with the loss of year-round E15 sales, what do you see as NCGA's role in finding a way to bring that back? You know, that's, that's a, it's a great question and it's a tough question because there's no easy answers. Um, you know, if you saw yesterday, Growth Energy is applying uh, um, to the Supreme Court to take a look at that. Um, so that, that's the last avenue that I understand uh, on the legal front. But we do have champions in, in Congress that are working to add a few words to the current legislation we have that will allow E15 to be sold year round. It's a tremendous product. It's great for the consumer. It's great for the environment. And so we will continue to work with whatever avenues are presented to us or with any um, other opportunities to continue to push the value of E15 on a year round basis. Thanks, Chris. And just a reminder, everyone, if you want to ask a question, you can type your name and who you're from in the chat, and I can unmute you, or you can type the whole question and I'll read it for you. Um, right now, I, we've got another question with Tom Block with Iowa Spokesman. Regarding profitability, are corn growers concerns about the big increase in fertilizer prices? I believe he meant concerned. Thanks for the question, Tom. And yes, absolutely. It's the conversation in a lot of people's tongues this fall um, in my local area and across the country. Um, not only is it the price, but is it the supply? Can they even get it? Because we're also hearing that once we get through the inventory that's, that the fertilizer dealers um, carried into the fall, their, their replenishment stock is not real great. So yes, it is a concern. It will probably have a uh, a deciding factor on some people, whether they go with corn, soybeans, wheat, or, or possibly uh, no fertilizer at all on some of those crops as far as P and K. Now, obviously, if you're going to raise corn, you're going to need some nitrogen of some form. And that is, uh, uh, anhydrous is up, but urea and the liquid UAN products are also up even more. And so um, once again, supply and demand. And right now, um, the supply is not equaling the current demand situation. So it will be a scenario we will be working not only this fall, but it, it's going to go into next spring and, and potentially even into next fall. Thanks, Chris. And we have a question from Will Robinson with Brownfield. Will, go ahead and unmute yourself and you should be able to talk. Hey, Chris, nice to uh, speak with you again. We talked at a Farm Progress show, I guess that was at the end of August now. So um, recently, Brownfield had an interview with the U.S. Energy Secretary, um, and she said that the, the RVO levels 
would likely be increased, not decreased. Can you give me just an idea of what, from your standpoint, farmers need those levels to be at? Well, well, the RVO numbers should be 15 billion gallons. That, that's what it says they should be. And, and why wouldn't they be there? And, you know, the interesting thing about that whole RFS and RVO and, and all of that is in years like last year where fuel consumption was down because of COVID and people staying home, the, it self-adjusted itself. So we should be putting the RVO numbers at 15 billion gallons. And the, the system, the RINs, um, all of that, they kind of they kind of self-regulate. It was designed really well by a whole bunch of people a number of years ago from all sides and all parties that were engaged in it. And we see no reason it should not be at 15 billion gallons. Thanks, Chris. I have a question from Ben from AgriPulse, kind of in the same vein. What will it mean for farmers if the Biden administration lowers RFS volume requirements and do you think this will erode trust farmers had in promises he made to maintain a robust RFS on the campaign trail? It certainly is not going to help trust if, if he lowers um, and goes against what he campaigned on and said that he was uh, very much in renewable fuels, liked renewable fuels, wanted to work with renewable fuels. And then, to, and then a year later to do something different than that um is is not not the way to move forward as, as a team it's not to work move forward you know in a method that's working together i understand people are all excited about electric vehicles and and they'll have they have a place um there's a lot of places they don't fit and ethanol and biodiesel and renewable diesel are here and now they are immediate they're immediate ways to improve the environment they're immediate ways to lower the cost to the consumer on the miles that they drive. And they need, they need to remember that. And we continually have to um, re-educate that the tool that has been around a while and is not so shiny like EVs is still a fantastic tool to use and needs to be used on a daily basis. Thanks, Chris. Um, right now, we don't have any more questions. If you have a question, feel free to type your name and who you're from in the chat, or you can type the whole question and I'll read it for you. I don't want to hold everybody too long. I'll give it another minute or so for another question or two, and then we'll wrap up if we need to, unless we have some more questions pour in. Another question from Todd Neely. He says, what are your thoughts on how the current EPA is or isn't working with agriculture to this point? You know, Todd, it's, it's a great question. And, and, I was just talking with somebody here the other day. The EPA is a, is a very interesting organization because they touch lots of things. You know, we, we deal with them on WOTUS and, and waters, and, and sometimes we're on the same page and sometimes we're not. We deal with them with ethanol and renewable fuels and energy policy. Um, sometimes we're in court siding with them, and sometimes we're in court against them. <clears throat> and so... It, it, it seems to be that, that uh, our challenges with the EPA um, or our opportunities to work together um, will be there on, on many, many issues. The current administration and the, and the current administrator has been very forward, very frank, and he wants to work with us. He says, we may not agree on everything, but we need to work together as a team to, to touch on the bases that they touch on that we're also engaged in. And so I'm hopeful that that type of open dialogue is going to allow us to, uh, um, it, while we may not agree on all issues, at least we will have a good, robust discussion around those issues and how we got to the point we're at. Thanks, Chris. We got a question from Tom Block. He says, can you give us a quick update on harvest progress and results on your farm? Sure, Tom. Um, yeah, I live in north central Iowa. 
Um, we spent most of the summer in a, in a drought, uh, D1, D2, and a little while we were in D3. Um, and a, a crazy, a crazy growing year, uh, honestly, for us. Um, started off dry. We were dry last fall, and it never changed. Um, so the crops went in pretty early. Uh, a lot of people were done early, very early May, um, including our operation on both corn and soybeans. And so you got some rains in May and, and June was dry and hot. And you, you all know that we set records in a lot of places for how dry and how hot June was. And yet we were fortunate to get some, some July rains um, and, and, and they kept things going, kept the crop going, um, didn't look too bad. Obviously the, the lighter soils were, were in, were in trouble. Um, and so we got to the end of August and we had about uh, half of our normal rainfall. And the crops surprisingly still had hung together. They looked pretty good. And, and then on one night, uh, the 27th of August here in our area, we got nine to 12 inches of rain. So I, uh, I have uh, normal rainfall for the growing season. Um, soybeans, we're actually probably gonna have an above average crop. Um, it's, it's, uh, if you didn't get white mold and we do have fields with white mold, um, those fields are, are hurting. But if they if the field stayed healthy and didn't get white mold, um, the beans have been pretty darn good. I've heard lots of people pretty happy with them. Um, lots of high 50s, low 60s um, uh, fields that uh, haven't been beans in quite a while or even each reaching the upper 60s and, and lower 70s. Corn is kind of all over the board. Um, we've got corn that was flat. We got we got 150 acres that took us three days to combine uh, with two combines. And uh, so in those flat spots, there wasn't a lot of corn. Um, but in the standing spots, it was, it was pretty decent corn. And we're seeing that all over. There's, there's 100, 150 bushel ranges um, in the same pass across the field, depending on soil type. But surprisingly, when you get to the end of the day, the average for the field is, um, we're, we're, there's a lot that's right touching around the 200. Um, some a little over, some a little under, which is, down from last year, uh, but we'll probably be fairly close to a lot of farmers' APH uh, in the area as their historical averages. But uh, there's no question um, compared to like 2012, which was a different type of drought and a different uh, timing of the drought, um, we've got a better crop than that. Um, and there's also been some tremendous improvements on seed genetics uh, in the last 10 years, which has also helped with that. So We'll have probably an above average bean crop in Northern Iowa, I think, from what I'm hearing, and pretty close to an average corn crop. Thanks, Chris. Right now, I don't see any other questions. Just give it another minute or so if a question pop up, otherwise we'll wrap up. We don't wanna hold everybody on too long. Chris, I don't see any other questions. Do you have any closing thoughts you want to add? And then we'll wrap up. Yeah, just, just I want to re reiterate, uh, A, thank you for joining us this morning and joining me on this. But um, you will hear this from me all year. Um, this is a team. And I totally believe you're part of the team. Um, you are our voice in a lot of cases. You carry the messages that NCGA, ASA, uh, NCBA, NPPC, um for agriculture out out to the world and people look up to you and listen to you every single day to hear what you have to say so i truly believe you are part of the team and part of the organization and uh, um, it's just going to be an honor to represent corn you know for the next year and i really need um you know you want to reach out you want to touch base with uh with me you go right ahead uh, my contact information is there at ncga um, edgington at ncga is my email um, i am a little bit active on twitter um, at chris Kredge. if you want to follow there i usually show pictures of things you're not supposed to do or pictures of of uh, the next generation of family that wants to farm um, my kids grew up they didn't have the buddy seats that we have in today's tractors and combines and and we have uh, lots of little ones riding with us which also raises the uh, the safety concerns and everybody has to be very cautious um, with, the, with the littles that are running. But 
I truly appreciate your work and your efforts and um, reach out at any time and uh, we can have another conversation. But uh, thank you for being part of the Ag Team. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thanks everybody for joining. We'll let you guys get back to your, your day and uh, have a good day.